and Charles. I'm Keith Gosland. I'm Linda Quinlan, and welcome to All Things LGBTQ. It is Tuesday, October 29th, and we're taping at Orca Media, which we know is unceded indigenous land. Anne, what do you got for us? Um, did we say the date? Yes, she mm -hmm. did. Okay. Well, here we are on that date. <laughs> <laughs> I have exciting news, and I'm okay. going to report on my first story at length, even um, though, it, well, let me just start. Let's start with Europe, and I'd like you to meet Michael Stuka, a shepherd of the world's first flock of gay sheep. <laughs> There's a picture of him and some of the sheep, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about this. Uh, he's looking after 21 gay rams whose wool is used to make clothing items in aid of LGBTQ plus causes. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> These gay sheep are stars of the hour. The flock of 21 rams on a farm in Westphalia, Germany, have risen to fame through a fresh fashion <laughs> brand called Rainbow Wool, which produces caps, patches, and shoelaces from the wool of the fluffy new celebrities. What's more, the profit goes entirely to LGBTQ plus causes. Since the project launched, Shepherd Michael Strack's phone won't, won't stand still. In the last weeks, there hasn't been a day which I haven't given an interview, the 51-year-old farmer says. A member of the Gay Farmer Network in Germany, Stuck is gay himself and lives on a farm with his husband. The project developed from a conversation he had about homosexual behavior in sheep with a friend. According to studies, apparently about one in 12 sheep are gay. Uh, sometimes rams jump at each other trying to mate or entirely reject the females and only show interest in males. Our friend asked, what's happening to those sheep? I said they will be slaughtered for meat because they are not suitable for breeding. As Stuck explains, regulations dictate that there must be one ram per 50 watt ewes, uh, and that ram is expected to sire offspring. If the ram is gay, he obviously doesn't do that. So like many other male sheep, the gay rams end up in the slaughterhouse. Stuck's friend wondered if anything could be done to change this, and if the ram's wool could be used for something. It was then that the idea of rainbow wool was born, and the Friends PR Communications Agency bought 21 gay rams from breeders. In September 23, the first rams moved to the farm. While, when many people work together, bringing different perspectives and ideas with them, a project can go very far. I witnessed step by step how it all developed, and I'm so happy that we succeeded in making various good quality products from the wool and have succeeded in bringing the many different breeds together. Because every breed has its own wool quality. This makes the wool more difficult to process, but we found a spinning mill, spinning mill that spins the wool. Um, the results of the products available in Rainbow Wool's online shop for quite a high price, however. Do people really pay that much? Yes, he says. The products are in high demand. I learned very fast that this goes down really well with the younger generation. They find it cool to have shoelaces made from the wool of gay rams. <laughs> a sheep, the sheep farmer admits he didn't expect the project to be as successful and as big as it has become. What's the name of the company? Um, Rainbow Wool. Rainbow, Rainbow Wool. Rainbow Wool. All right. A gay celebrity sheep and their fashion products have hit like a bomb, the gay celebrity sheep. Uh, and Stuck barely got any negative reactions to the project. Even a famous German singer from the internationally acclaimed band Tokyo Hotel, himself bisexual, visited the farm. Uh, he promoted the initiative in his fashion products and adopted two rams. <laughs> it was very exciting for us to hear that a celebrity would be visiting us, but I first doubted that Bill would really come. But he did, and he was a very nice and natural guy. He continues, this is the farmer, what really delights me is that so many people profit from the project, not just one person who came up with the idea. The entire profit goes to the Federation Queer Diversity in Germany, which help various, helps various LGBTQ mm. causes. Even the breeders seem to be happy about the arrangements, where slaughterers have been outbid to get the sheep. Mm. 
I think knowing that their animals can continue to live here made them all on board. But the sums paid for these rams are significantly above the usual slaughter prices. To stop breeders from claiming their rams are gay just to make a profit, Stuck shares how they recognize the homosexual behavior in the animals. <laughs> The jumping on each other isn't the criterion, but showing no interest in the ewes and refusing to mate the mating act is a good sign. <laughs> the flock we have here, they obviously show interest in each other. He adds, we also talked to our vet about the topic and I was surprised to hear what she said. Some of the information on gay sheep was still very new to me, maybe even a bit strange at first. But a quite a lot, quite, apparently quite a lot of studies exist on the topic. Could there be more LGBTQ plus sheep, like lesbian, bi, or trans sheep? <laughs> While Strook can't answer that question for sure, he shares that with female sheep, it's harder to witness any clear homosexual behavior. But to be honest, so far I haven't had time to scrutinize that. Ask about the future of the project, Stuck had thought about bringing out a whole clothing collection, but one sheep can only produce four kilograms of wool, and they are only sheared once a year. With 21 rams, our possibilities are currently very limited, he explains. We shear the gay sheep separately from our own to gain their wool independently. If a few more gay rams appear, and if everything can be marketed well, the project might be able to successfully grow and the products be extended. We have plenty of ideas. The space on Strook's farm is there for the fluffy queer flock to take on more members. There's, that's absolutely no problem, he says. We assume that we can keep about 100 rams. Until then, people can support the project by adopting one of the rams. The sponsorship helps guarantee that the sheep can have a good life on the farm until they are old and die of old age. This is possible from everywhere, so anyone looking for a gay god sheep can look, How can cool sign up this? as well. Uh, with Rainbow Wool's campaign currently seeming to be the first of its kind across the world, farmer Michael Stuck certainly hopes to inspire other sheep makers to start a similar scheme. I just hope they don't want to make a profit entirely for themselves and do something good with the proceeds for society. Nice. Is that cool or what? That, that is wonderful. very cool. I'm going to go on the site and get myself some. A sheep? Shoelaces. I was going to say some expensive shoelaces. Yeah. <laughs> All right, one more story from Europe um, before we'll probably move to Keith, although I have many, many more. Let's look at a clip from Lesvia, which is Greek for Lesbos, I imagine. Since the 1970s, this is a documentary. Since the 1970s, lesbians from around the world would flock to a small village on the Greek island of Lesbos. As tensions between the newly arrived lesbians and local residents rose, Tzili Hajimatru, caught in the middle as a local and lesbian as a local and a lesbian herself, chronicled 40 plus years of love, community, conflict, and what it means to feel accepted. Unfortunately, this is not available for streaming right now, but keep your eyes peeled and let's look, look, look at a clip now for Lesvia. All women from all over the fucking place of the earth. E io andai dal primo vecchietto a dire, do you know where girls here, they stay together? For me it was kind of a lost paradise. Bajo tierra estarás, nunca de ti muerta. Because it was really an explosion, processing identities. It was life changing to see older versions of myself. I'd never seen this before. Siempre sin luz, junto a los muertos. Sembrava di vivere una società all'incontrario. Non era una chiriarchia e andrichi mafia. Un endroit où on se sentait en sécurité, un endroit qui était tendre. Ya na ese out and proud, sa prima na crekina sa bravo kuna ese in ke safe. Ya na no 
ti sant po e tan lesbia. Yeah, mas. Non ne vidria, de vera de come senti putallo. I don't think there was a concept of what a lesbian was when we came here first. Ne borusa na to connection dole venti se soresco pais, ne ta de hol de antes. Oni che non è for you and you. Lesbians that have gone before us, we're not very good at sharing our history of how we got there. Okay. So interesting. Yeah. Now, okay, Keith. Our, our history continues. That's right. <laughs> or your history continues. Okay, this is the trivia question, and I've rephrased it a little bit. <laughs> This was the first out LGBTQIA 2S person elected as a state executive officer in the US. Who might that have been? And bonus points for the office and the year. Oh, <laughs> God. Yeah, I know. Ray Rainbow Umbrella Women's Discussion Group? Book Are group? You gonna, will, will you? Continue talking on the political theme that you have for the last couple of shows and what you gave notice for the upcoming discussion? Well, um, I didn't publish, I have the summary from the last meeting and I haven't published it, I haven't sent it around yet, but it was so interesting. We talked about the women in abstract expressionism. Right. And how they were overlooked and it was just, we all learned a lot. Okay. Yeah. And the book discussion group, and you are reading? Same book. Which Same is? Book. Memoirs of a Next Country. OK. I, I want to make sure we keep promoting the book in case people want to come. Exactly. Rainbow Bridge. And we're going to put up their list of all their events. But they've got some things coming up. And just as a sample for next week, on Monday the 4th, is their all recovery meeting. And this is a recovery meeting designed specifically for LGBTQIA2S people. So you don't have to be careful in you know, what you say or don't say or who might be in the room. Tuesday on November 5th is their free somatic street therapy. And this is body practices to help relieve stress. And they're doing it on election day. They're brave people. <laughs> on Friday, the eighth breakthrough parenting and hold on to this thought because this is if you think you might have some interaction with the, the Vermont State Child Welfare System. Keep that in mind for a story that's coming up. <coughs> and then on Saturday the 9th is the ISTAR Collective Pop-Up and they do this in collaboration with People's Health and Wellness. Okay. And this is an initiative specifically looking out, reaching out to transgender people for health care, food, resources, advocacy, what they say, connection and joy. Can't have enough of it. Keep in mind, Fox Market, go onto their website. Every month they do a queer poetry reading. I know it. I keep waiting for you. <laughs> Out in the 802, I happened to run into two of the organizers recently. They said, well, Every Thursday night, there's a pop-up somewhere. The one that happens in St. Albans is actually a game night. Mm. Bring your favorite board game. Sit, play, socialize. They also said that when- Not if it's not bridge. <laughs> you, well, you could bring a deck of cards and suggest it. They also said that when they first started doing organizing and pushing past Chittenden County, that they got some resistance. Oh, you're not going to get people in attendance. They said the events they've been hosting in rural areas, they've gotten up to 60 people. I believe it. Right. And, and again, because they, you know, there's a lot of places they have no way to go. Exactly. And again, they say everyone is welcome. You know, we know that they originally started as a gay male social organization. And at times, it's hard for them to push past that. They said they're trying. <laughs> and on November 9th, they're having out on the town in Hardwick mm. at the Cork and Fork starting at 3 o'clock. <coughs> and that if you want to stay for dinner and make reservations, 
apparently Cork and Fork is owned by two gay men. Who knew? Is that the one with that, that glass one on the main street, do you think? I don't know. I I'm, I'm going to have to do a drive through yeah. So Boston Spirit, which you know I like to peruse every now and then. Sometimes it tells me things I don't know about my own state. They did a whole article about how wonderful Stowe is and why you should come and spend time in Stowe. And they're already promoting the winter rendezvous. Yes, I interviewed that the guy who several years ago. Yeah. And it's going to be January 22nd through the 26th. And apparently, it's nominated for the favorite gay ski week in the US. Huh. So we're getting up there. Also, and we were talking back and forth, and there are more dates. Toussaint on November 23rd at the Phoenix Gallery in Stowe. The Stowe Theater Guild is sponsoring a performance and book signing of Toussaint's latest book, Mountain Spells. And did we report that Toussaint was nominated to be the Vermont Poet Laureate? No. We um, knew, but I guess we didn't report I, it. I, because I didn't remember reporting on it. Mm -hmm. All right. So with that. So it's my turn? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So. Because, um, you know, we've, we've got things in waiting. I know. <laughs> that gay sheep, though, that was really I cool. I love that. <laughs> They outdo the penguins. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, the most comprehensive political survey of LGBTQ Americans ever conducted, the Pew Research Center found in 2013 that the vast majority of respondents, 85% always or nearly always voted, compared with roughly a third of the general population. Turnout in most recent presidential election validated that finding. A 2020 post-election survey by the advocacy group GLAD found that 81% of LGBTQ voters cast a ballot. All right. So good for us, huh? Hold, hold that thought. Yeah, really. Um, and in Richmond, Virginia, diversity Richmond, a local nonprofit that supports the greater Richmond area's LGBT community, released a, pro a preliminary design for its new Celebrate Diversity state license plate. Ooh. The organization wanted a license plate that reflected the diversity within the LGBT community across Virginia. Staff input and community responses contributed to the final design. It was in the works around 15 months ago and then released in September, right after Diversity Richmond's 25th anniversary. So, very nice. Go Richmond. Now, please excuse my puncture, my um, pronunciation. pronunciation. I hope it's right, but it probably isn't. So, last Saturday, last Sunday, a troupe of Jewish drag artists called Full Moon Drag came together to create a shuka, suka, 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 a shelter made for Sukkot at a Maple Street community garden in Crown Heights in Brooklyn, New York. Under the overhanging willow tree, their suka adorned with poppies and kifiyas. Kifiyas. Yes, and hand painted free Palestinian, thank you. Banner set the stage for their production titled Hot to Rot. The troupe performed to an audience of 100 community members and successfully raised $2,000 for a local mutual aid organization fighting for neighbors to stay in their homes and be free of police violence. <clears throat> Equality for Flatbush, a Denison's Society, an international mutual aid organization that supplies housing and food for Gazan refugees. And here is a photo of that group. Of course that story needed a photo. Yes. <laughs> okay, now we have the lovely Senator Ted Cruz. Oh, I'm so hopeful that he'll be on TV. Oh, boy, wouldn't that be just wonderful? Wouldn't it just be it's really close, good? close, I think. It is it close, is 1%, close. at least by polls. 
Uh, U.S. Senator Ted Cruz is under fire for using unauthorized images of two cisgender teenage girls in several campaign ads targeting transgender athletes. The ads, which are part of Cruz's multi-million dollar re-election <coughs> campaign against Democrat Colin Alfred, Alred, criticized Alred for supporting policies that allow transgender athletes to compete in sports aligned with their gender identity. However, the Beverton School District in Oregon, where one of the teens whose image appears in the ads attends school, has demanded Cruz's campaign take down the ads. Neither the students nor the school gave permission for Cruz to use their image. Mm. And, oh. and he misgendered them in the opposite direction of what we're used to. I know. <laughs> Um, let's see. So we have conservative LGBT people in North Carolina pushing for Trump votes. Organized by the a log cabin Republicans Unity, they said they were more interested in putting money in their pockets than LGBTQ issues. Pronouns were marked by attendees. Now I have a clip that I wanted to show in this first segment. Um, and it is, um, it, this is a short clip from Hannah Gadsby's new comedy skit called Woof. This is a very different show than the one I had planned for you, I have to be honest. <laughs> this is a better show. I have no problem with getting rid of shows that are not viable. I'm not Alabama. I'm going to get cancelled by feminists. I don't think there's anything more feminist than getting cancelled by feminists. <laughs> the theme of this show is I think I'm losing my mind, right? That wasn't the theme of Nanette. I'd already lost my mind in Nanette, but now I'm on the oxy. Jen, oxygen. I worried about whales. I worried about biscuits, about hemorrhoids, not my own, just generally. Hey. Hey. Luna, can you say asbestos? <laughs> Any requests? And it's supposed to, you know, it's gotten mixed reviews, we'll see. What, what did Is I it on Netflix? It is not anywhere right now. It's going to be, um, it's going to be in, uh, I think, uh, Netflix eventually. But right now, it's, it, I don't know where it is, actually. It's the film festivals. Film festivals. Yeah, because Ann Northrup. Yeah, the, the film USA festivals. Side. But yeah. uh, I, I imagine it'll be on streaming sometime in the really near future. Um, so then we have. Instead of putting funds towards education, U.S. public schools have been forced to spend approximately $3.2 billion on security, public relations, and legal assistance combating right-wing attacks. <clears throat> That's the estimated cost of conservatives targeting schools for supposedly teaching about race and LGBTQ identities during the 2023-24 school year, according to the new report from the University of California. <clears throat> and uh, researchers surveyed 467 public schools superintendents across 46 states, finding steep costs even in districts that reported low levels of conflict. The districts, which serve uh, an average of 10,000 students per year, reported expenses of 249 thousand dollars on average in low conflict districts and five hundred thousand on average in moderate conflict districts and eight hundred and eleven thousand on average in high school conflict districts districts with low conflict saved an estimated five hundred and sixty two thousand so mm. it's costing those little pockets liberal mm -hmm. pockets a lot of money even uh, when they don't, um, so. So let's, um, 
I'll do one more story and then we'll move back to Ann. So this is, while Republicans continue to approach the closing days of 2024 election cycle by doubling down on grievance and hatred with transphobic messaging, Grace, a transgender advocacy group, is offering a compassion counterpoint with a new public service announcement featuring Eric Charles, a conservative South Carolina U.S. Army combat veteran and father of a transgender child. In the ad, Charles shares an earnest message about the importance of love, freedom, and standing for his child. Charles reflects on his military service in the PSA, emphasizing the principles he fought to protect. Freedom means liberty. It means the ability to live your life as you see it, he says. Legislators shouldn't be anywhere near my child's doctor's office. My child has parents that get to decide his health care. The legislators that want to dictate these bills don't have the education nor the credentials to make these kinds of decisions. That is not okay. That's not freedom. That's regulation. Mm. So, good for him. Yeah. Okay, Ian, what you got? Well, quite a, quite a few stories, really. Um, not surprisingly. <laughs> I'm still in Europe. Um, and let me tell you about what's going on in France. Seven tr trolls cyber-bullied the gay Paris Olympics artistic director, and they've been charged. They've been arrested and charged for allegedly cyber-bullying the artistic director um, the arrests were the first wave in a series of prosecutions they intend to carry out in the aftermath of a coordinated campaign threatening Thomas Jolly, the mastermind of the opening and closing of the ceremonies in July and August. And remember, I reported on, on mm -hmm. it at the time. Um, oh. Prosecutors said the homophobic and anti-Semitic abuse online uh, escalated quickly following the opening ceremony Ammonia across the Seine, which featured drag queens, a performance by Lady Gaga, and a scene that detractors describe as a sacrilegious depiction of the Last Supper. Uh, Jolly denied that the tableau was based on the final meal, <laughs> saying instead that it was meant to depict a Dionysian feast. I mean, I reported on all this. <coughs> the seven individuals charged face counts of death threats, aggravated insults, and cyberbullying, and could face prison time, the range in age from 22 to 79. Uh, he defended, Jolly defended his vision. Um, I didn't set out to mock any religion, noting the ceremony's references to Notre Dame Cathedral were an homage to France's cultural heritage, not a sacrilegious indictment. Another defense, he said, my um, wish isn't to be subversive nor to mock or shock. Most of all, I wanted to send a message of love, a message of inclusion, and not at all to divide. Now, I love what the mayor of Paris says. <laughs> She's in elected office. The mayor of Paris Anne Hidalgo went further in comments after the Olympics concluded in August, saying, fuck the reactionaries, fuck this far right, fuck all those who would like to look at us, <laughs> to lock us into a war against all. The prosecutor's office said online harassment is part of a larger trend in France directed at public figures, highlighting the abuse and death threats against Jolly as an example, example of other campaigns to intimidate and silence impression, uh, expressions of inclusivity and diversity using a highly public and symbolic event to do so. The seven accused are scheduled to appear in court on March 5th. I like that mayor of Paris. She doesn't mince words. Yeah, exactly. Next, I'm counting Russia as part of Europe. Moscow police detained over 50 people in a raid on LGBTQ venues. And I have a picture before you now. Cops stormed two Moscow gay clubs following civilian <clears throat> complaints of drag performances and men kissing each other freely. And of course, this about 250, 200 people were at the bar, which is called Central Station. It's unclear where the more than 50, take, 50 people taken into custody are detained. 
um, Italian lawmakers have passed a bill to ban overseas surrogacy. This is Georgia Maloney, the right-wing mm -hmm. prime minister. Um, it criminalizes the use of surrogacy overseas in which LGBTQ activists are saying is a direct attack on same-sex parents. Um, while the vast majority of Italians who engage in overseas surrogacy are heterosexual couples, activists fear the law will be used specifically to uh, target male same-sex couples who cannot simply pretend to have used a surrogate. Pretend not to have used a surrogate. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for your quizzical looks. <laughs> that would fit with the pattern of attacking same-sex parents since Maloney took office in 2022. Last year, as you know, uh, the government issued an order directing municipalities to delete non-biological same-sex parents from birth certificates. Um, that oh, decision- Italy changes governments like gloves. Let's hope they get rid of mm -hmm. her soon. Yes, and, but an odd event in Poland, uh, a long-awaited civil union legislation was introduced last week, revealing that the government has dropped plans to allow couples and civil unions to adopt children in a compromise meant to get the bills through Parliament. Now, we recall that um, Poland now has a new prime minister, mm -hmm. Donald Trusk, who had pledged to introduce this legislation within his first 100 days, but of course that got bogged down. Uh, the bills would allow same-sex and opposite couples, sex couples, to register their partnerships, giving partners rights to inheritance and medical decision-making. But couples can't, you know, adopt, because that was their uh, trade-off. Oh, that would be too much. And also the bills are unlikely to pass, <laughs> because this opposition right. is still um, in power, and has enough power to um, oppose them. But they're hoping after Duda, the current right-wing guy, is uh, his term expires in 2025, and everybody are positioning themselves. The you know, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Trus Tusk's group is positioning themselves to move. We can hope. The England and Wales Cricket Board has banned trans women from the top tiers of women's <laughs> domestic cricket. Um, trans women will no longer be able to participate in a limit in elite women's domestic cricket in England. We only have time for one more story, and Don't say it. I am saying. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> well, Pick it you, well. I have all these pictures. I'll give you the headlines then. A breakup was a motive behind hockey's pro, hockey pro's That's murder, police say. And here's a picture of Jeanne Pukaka. They had broken up. Uh, he went back to collect his things and was shot to death by his partner, his ex-partner. A British priest died. Another arrest, another arrested after a night of poppers, ecstasy, and gay sex. So I have a picture now of, uh, and they met. They met at uh, Pope Francis's visit, one of his <laughs> visits to the Vatican. Oh boy. Um, Andrew Wagstaff, 69, Father Andrew Wagstaff, staff. And so his poor partner is pretty stuck. Um, he's also a priest. Uh, South Korean Christian groups, remember I reported last time mm -hmm. about South Korea's progressive legislation. So now Christian groups in massive protest against rights for same-sex couples. They, hundreds of thousands of them marched. Now this is a great story. And I have a picture before you of a China trans woman, Chinese trans woman, who beats up a man for mocking her <laughs> and then posts a video denouncing violence. <laughs> so let's look at a picture of John Yan. And first she's beating up this guy who is harassing her. And then there she, there's a picture because she's, you know, a celebrity and has 44,000 followers. She's a be online beauty influencer. And what happened was they, they were in a restaurant and the guy she, she's from uh, Hunan. She was born in Hunan, and this person started 
attacking her and harassing her for being from Hunan. She said the man claimed to be a lawyer from Hong Kong. He called people from Hunan poor and ugly and threw food and rubbish at her. And so she went after him. She was accused of striking. Uh, she accused him of attacking her. Um, <laughs> I've become a woman, but if my hometown needs me, I will still stand up and fight without hesitation. She apologized, they apologized, but she took her high heels and <laughs> kept smacking them. So, um, I'm that, never going to view dining out the same again. <laughs> no. So then, you know, people. Some people said, "Good for you." People from Hunan, yeah. and then others said, "No, no, no." One more thing. Well, I know, Ian. We're out of time. You have another picture? I have two pictures. One. Um, <laughs> This is now our North America club owner, Homo Omar Guido Chavez, 51, was found dismembered in the trunk of his car. He's a gay bar owner. Yeah, and I they, heard that one. They don't think it's a hate crime because they think he was in the Sinaloa Drugs. drug cartel left a message oh. in the car. And then um, I have more pictures, uh, just one more, going to Africa quickly very quickly. Um, hundreds march to mark 35 years of pride in Johannesburg, South Africa. Mm -hmm. There's a picture of them. And finally, this is kind of mixed news. Uganda's Kill the Gays bill will cost the country as much as $1.6 billion in its first year. The anti-LGBTQ law may alter the trajectory of the country's economy for years to come. Good. I saw that. So the election, it's next week. This is important. Even if you think you know how Vermont is going to vote, you must vote. And at this point in time, it's too late to mail in your ballot. You need to either put it in a drop box or bring it with you on election day or bring it to the town clerk. But there are down or ticket vote that day, right? Or well, well that's you bring it to the right. polling place. Right. There are down ticket items that are critical. The current Republican gubernatorial candidate is using their campaign saying, I need common sense legislators trying to chip away at the Democratic supermajority, which is how we've been able to get bills on housing, climate change, dealing with addiction. Education, yeah. But, and looking at some of those down ticket items, I hope you watched Ann's interview with Josie Levitt. Josie is in a district that as Ann pointed out to me, Josie won by nine votes during the last election. This is going to be critical. And when you listen to the interview, this is someone we want advocating for us in the State House. And the guy the, running with her against her is a bad guy. There are two. We're, we're not going there. We're not going we're there. We're not? We're not going okay. there. Okay. They are. We're not going there. <laughs> As Linda pointed out to me, both Boston Spirit and The Advocate has picked up on the one new LGBTQIA2S candidate who's running, and it's Will Greer. Who looks like 12. He looks 12. He's, he's 21. <coughs> it's the Bennington 2 district. And what the Victory Fund has said is that when elected, he may be the youngest out LGBTQIA2S legislator in the country. <laughs> so your vote is important. Get out there it and is vote your for vote. Will. Use it. Okay. As I promised on the last show, US Supreme Court, they've taken up a case that we really need to follow. And this is the US versus Scormetti. And this is the case coming out of Tennessee. And this started in April of 2023. It was a lawsuit that was brought against Texas's ban on gender affirming care for minors. And this started out as Senate Bill 1. 
and I point that out because Senate Bill 1 designation is significant. This was the first bill they introduced into their Senate during that legislative session. <laughs> this bill was signed into law by the Tennessee governor. It would bar medical providers from prescribing puberty blockers or hormone replacement therapy or performing gender affirming surgeries on trans people under the age of 18. Furthermore, if practitioners break the law to provide life-saving transition-related care to their patients, they risk a $25,000 fine in addition to legal action. And it went on to say that all minors who were actively receiving gender-affirming treatments before the ban was passed must immediately stop their medications wow. by March 31st. <clears throat> Crazy. So there was a wave of families leaving Tennessee. There was a lawsuit that was brought. The law was halted. The state appealed. There was a court action that ruled, no, 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 the law wasn't unconstitutional. Then there was one saying it was, that it was constitutional. Then one that said it wasn't constitutional. So the state then appealed it to the U.S. Supreme Court level. Wow. And that's when the U.S. versus stepped in. It was the Biden administration saying, no, 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 no. You know, we oppose this. And they allowed the private litigants to be actively involved in the case and to argue in front of the Supreme Court. Why that is significant is that one of the people who is going to be litigating before the U.S. Supreme Court is Chase Strangio. And if I mispronounced your name, I truly apologize, because Chase will be the first openly trans attorney <laughs> to litigate before the U.S. Supreme wow. Court. What is critical about this case, and, and I have lots of trepidation, is you know this is a conservative court. Oh well, yeah. And how they've ruled previously, this is going to set the standard for transgender care, particularly for minors, for years to come. And as was pointed out by HRC and the ACLU, there are currently 26 states that have some kind of ban on transgender procedures relative to minors or minors being able to access services. They're all going to so have to move. We're, we're gonna, well, Vermont is a sanctuary state, so we need housing. We yeah. need health care. In a related story, and I alluded to this before, New Hampshire, there is a, was a suit against the ban that was passed and, and Sununu allowed to go into law that would ban transgender athletes from competing. Well, there was a transgender student who came forward and their parents brought suit so that the law was halted. The opposition has started showing up at all of the games where the transgender student or the transgender athlete is competing and doing a demonstration oh. against the student. Mm. And they're wearing um, pink no, armbands. Well, no, pink armbands with an X on them. They've brought suit against the Bow School District because the Bow School District refused to allow them to organize or to hold a counter demonstration during the game because they said it was in opposition for state statutes about creating civility in public forums mm. and not promoting hate. So the Institute for Free Speech, remember that name because we're going to be hearing it more, they brought a suit against the school district saying, you're silencing these parents is a violation of, oh my, their constitutional right of freedom of speech. You can see this already fast tracking to the U.S. Supreme Court based on the Not argument. another one. Oh, God. So there you go. I just feel every time it goes to the Supreme Court, we lose. 
<coughs> not always, though. Not always, but frequently. Um, we hold our breath. Especially on these issues. And on a, a, a less upbeat um, and positive uh, role model, shall we say, is the former CEO of clothing company, oh. Eric Crombie. Eric Crombie. Fitch. <laughs> has been arrested on sex trafficking charges. Selling more than clothing, huh? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mike Jeffries, 80, and his partner Matthew Smith and their associate James Jacobson was indicted Tuesday morning by a federal grand jury in the East District of New York on over a dozen counts related to sex trafficking, trafficking between 2008 and 2015. The three are accused of recruiting aspiring male models and coercing them into performing sex acts to further their careers. Jeffries and his associates were, would allegedly bring the men who expressed the desire to become models for Abercrombie and Fitch to sex parties where the men would be given drugs, alcohol, and Viagra, then made to perform sex acts. So. And on another bad note, I don't know if anybody knows this, but a man in Washington State is under arrest after he accused after he was accused of tying a noose around the neck of his 14-year-old son, this. who moments earlier revealed that he was gay. Seattle TV station KIRO reports police also say the man used the same rope to tie his 13-year-old biological son around the torso. Joseph Sweeney, 38, of Bremerton, was taken into custody by deputies with the Kitsap County Sheriff's Office on Monday. He is charged with a hate crime and two counts of second-degree assault for the incident at his residence. How'd they find out? I don't know. The, ki the kid must have said something. Mm -hmm. um, so. It didn't sound as though he was trying to hide it either. No. No. And after decades, of si after decades of silence on this subject, Al Pacino says he's aware of the criticism levied against the 1980 film Cruising. I think and he argues that in Boston. <laughs> yeah. The actor revealed in a recent memoir, Sonny Boy, that he was so uncomfortable with how the final cut of the movie portrayed LGBTQ plus people that he ended up anonymously donating the, his entire paycheck to various charities. I never accepted the paycheck for cruising. I took the money, and it was a lot, and I put it in an irrevocable trust, meaning once I gave it, there was no taking it back. I don't know if it eased my conscience, but at least the money did some good. Oh. That and movie did so much damage. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see, what do we got? Oh, um, oh, this is about college applicants. Um, and um, college applicants are ruling out universities based on the politics of the state. Oh, yeah, I would. They resign in, yeah. and LBGT plus students are being particularly vigilant. Over a quarter of applicants, 28%, said they exclude schools solely based on the political considerations in the state where the institution is located. According to a recent survey from the Art and Science Group, Texas was the most rejected state, yep. mm. earning the top spot among liberal, both liberals and moderates, which state students ruled out largely fell along party lines, with conservative students most likely to rule out New York and California. <laughs> what a shame. <laughs> yeah. a lot. And liberal students more likely to rule out Florida, Arkansas, and Tennessee. Moderate students also excluded California, Florida, and New York. So, I was say, when, students, huh? I was gonna say, when we were helping our transgender youth look at schools, we looked at what, those 26 states where if you go to school here, there's a real chance that we may not be able to send you your medications. Mm. 
you, know, you may not be able to get the health care to which you're entitled and you need. So. Well, Ann, we have a few more minutes if you have anything that you would like to share with of us. Of course she does. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> um, I could talk more about this North American gruesome killing. Um, oh, if I'd known, I would have prepared. Well, you know, you just never know how things are going to go. <laughs> and we need time for the trivia. Yes, yeah, so you better get on that one story. Oh, dear. Huh. Um, well, um, <laughs> we'll go back to Omar Guido Chavez. Uh, he disappeared on October 16th. His body was found two days later in the trunk of his car. He was uh -huh. decapitated and his limbs were severed. Uh, two people were arrested in connection with the killing. Um, according to the newspaper, a banner allegedly signed by the Sanoa cartel was found in the back seat of his car with threats aimed at anyone who supports uh, Juan Manuel Hernandez, who allegedly runs a business selling slot machines and drugs, according to an international news website. It's suspected that the hit on Chavez may be over territorial control. Uh, two men were arrested on suspicion of being involved. They traced the car. Um, a Baja, California, a homicide prosecutor was asked if the case looked like a hate crime. He responded that there's no evidence pointing to a hate crime and that the strongest evidence is a threat when written on cardboard, cardboard that was found in the car with, his, with Chavez's remains. So it was kind of a warning. Oh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. No history, there's been no history of, of threats against him or the club. When asked if there were incidents involving drug sales in the club, the prosecutor said there was no record of that either, uh, but that the club is situated in central Tijuana, where a lot of drug traffic takes place. The day after his remains were found, um, an organization called Comunidad ABC posted an open letter on its Facebook page on behalf of several LGBTQ organizations in northern Mexico. Uh, it was addressed to the governor, demanding that they pay attention. All to right, this we need to do trivia now. Okay. Thank you, Ann, for filling us in. For for depressing us. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We we be, we become the you know. Watch what I'm doing so that you don't. So this was the first out LGBTQIA person elected as a state executive officer in 1992. It might have been Ed Flanagan mm -hmm. as Vermont's auditor of account. And he served in that capacity until 2001. He then went on to run for and become a Vermont senator representing Chittenden County and served from 2005 to 2011. Ed died in 2017 as the result of long-term complications of a car accident that he was yeah, involved so in, that. for which he sustained substantial traumatic brain injury. So, but thank you, Ed. So, so I think, hold your breath for the election, and uh, we'll see you the night of the election, correct? No, 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 we're, uh-uh. No. It's we're, a week from today is the election. A week from the day, yeah. And so, then Susan's gonna come in. Yeah, okay, so. And so we'll see you. Well, after the election, I hope it'll be settled by then. Vote, 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 and remember to resist. resist.